Good Wednesday morning, and today we'll be talking about why John started Augustine College. Augustine College is a classical Christian college in Ottawa, Canada, that teaches the foundations of Western intellectual and cultural history. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be with you again. A small error in your introduction. It would be uh, smarter to say that Augustine College started me than that I started Augustine College, because I didn't. Uh, I was part of a group that got fired up, and I think that's one of the interesting things about picking up from where we left off last time, that we started a reading group because we'd met a problem that we knew we ought to be able to answer, and we didn't. And the problem was simply this. A group of us had been brought together by Providence. Uh, That's another story. Uh, Initially, we just met for initially lunch and then later breakfast, uh, just to talk, fellowship. Uh, we were all senior professors in the university. We were moaning about the state of the university, you know, it would be wonderful if we could get rid of the, the sports program and the students and then it would be perfect. Uh, you know the kind of professors we represent. Anyway, um, as we talked, we, we were all Christian, we became aware, as we thought about it, this was way back in the 80s, late 80s, that coming to university from a Christian, particularly an evangelical background, and particularly if you'd been to Bible school first, um, was very dangerous. I usually say to parents who are thinking about school, the university you went to doesn't exist. The ones that exist now are likely to rob your children of their mind, their faith, and their virginity in the first year if they haven't lost at least one of them before. That's not a good outcome. You look at the Pew Research stuff. You're lucky if one in five students departing from your church comes back after university. They do come back in the end because the truth gets them there, but there's a 20-year gap. If you look at the church, you've got quite a lot of enthusiastic kids who live sheltered lives, and then there's a huge gap. They come back when families come along and marriage comes along, and they realize they need help from beyond themselves. So what what was happening, and what should be done about it? And we had no idea, because the world we lived in and the one that the students lived in had changed. So we decided to do what professors would always do. Let's read what other people have said about this. And we read everything we could find on the nature of education, beginning with the Greeks and ending up with Alastair MacIntyre in the 20th century. And in that process, a lot of things happened. First of all, we used to meet a little greasy spoon restaurant for breakfast, and quite shortly, graduate students started sitting at the table next to us, and they weren't talking to one another, they were listening to us. I said, look, you're listening to us, you might as well join us. So they did. And that group, with no paper trail, no advertising, on occasions had 30 people. We once counted 29 languages that were available to us around the table. That in part was uh, about half of them came from one woman who was a natural linguist and spent her life translating obscure languages. But it was an amazing experience. See, for me, I had, like many people who, are, who become physicians and scientists, you, you become fascinated by the subject when you're about eight years old. And I was lucky nobody told me you were supposed to cone down, but most kids do. So I refer to physicians affectionately as highly intelligent barbarians. Um, The reason they're barbarians is they don't have any history. And in fact, the CRT crowd are intent on producing students who have no history. They just know that the only thing that really matters is race, which is rubbish, but that's where we're at at the moment. Uh, That's a very reduced understanding of the world. But to have little or no history is the norm. To illustrate very quickly, Uh, to those who are listening. I want to tell you in the next two minutes a biography of a man whose name you should know. He he, He was born in London to a very poor family. His father was a blacksmith. What education he had was largely in the church, where he was frequently, three or four times a week. By the time he was Uh, 11 or 12, he was already employed, as was the norm in those days, and he had a job as an apprentice bookbinder. Fortunately, he had a good boss who realized he was a smart lad and said, look, you can read the books you're binding, you know, in your break periods. And so he did. Now, he was binding a lot of science, and he became fascinated by what was happening. 
So he was in London. There were free public lectures at the Royal Institute and sometimes the Royal Society. And he would go to those lectures and take notes. There's still a Christmas lecture for children that bears his name. There's a clue for you. Anyway, um, uh, by the time he was uh, 15, 16, that sort of age, uh, he knew he didn't want to spend his life binding books. What he really wanted was to be, in our terms, the lab tech who set up the experiments to go with the lectures at the Royal Institute. So he bound his treasured notes very well, uh, which he could do, and sent them to the president of the Royal Institute, uh, who was a very famous man, uh, and asked for the job. Unfortunately, this famous man was also a very humane man, and he was very impressed with the binding, and he read them. And he was impressed with the quality of the notes. And more importantly, he was incredibly impressed by what the young man thought should be done next. And with a few uh, hiccups, he got the job. Well, with it, because of that being in that position, all the scientists in the world who came through London met him. So all around the scientific community in the world, they knew there was a very smart young man in London who was working at the Royal Institute as a research, well, not as a research guy, as, as a lab tech, who'd never been to high school, let alone university, and he was smart. Well, in due course, he actually became president of the Royal Institute. He turned down the Royal Society several times on the grounds he was too busy. He was known to stop his committee meetings so that he could get to his prayer meeting. That upsets a lot of people these days, of course, but you do know his name. And the current generation in particular should give thanks for him every time they like their phone. Because it's Michael Faraday. And he had the concept of fields, and everybody laughed. That things could be going through space without wires or anything like that. He thought he could. In fact, he knew he could. He was right. Now, that story told at the beginning of the the section on electricity in high school, complete as I have told it, might stop some young cynics from being quite so cynical and might also stimulate some kids who couldn't care less to realise that, well, Maxwell was much worse... No, not Maxwell. Faraday was much worse off than me and look what he did. It might stimulate them. We all need role models. So that's one example. I didn't know that story. I'd, I was a scientist. I didn't know any scientific history. So as the reading group went on and other people joined us, then homeschooling mums and dads and graduate students said, look, you're making the case that the current university is not doing a good job what, and that we're not even prepared to come to what a university should be like. What are you going to do about it? And we said, well, nothing. What you need is an introduction to the intellectual history of the Western world because that's where science happened. It didn't happen anywhere else. Uh, people like to say the Greeks were scientists, they were classifiers, they never did experiments. The invention that turned everything around happened beginning around the 12th, 13th centuries, 14th century, that period, uh, and was the, was the invention of experimental science. Uh, that's a whole talk of an hour, but it's worth thinking about. If this intrigues you, if you're listening, the, the place to start is to get hold of uh, Rodney Stark's book for the glory of God and just read the chapter on God's handiwork and you get a very well-balanced introduction to the history of science. It's not as you're taught by silly high school teachers who are not educated that science is for people who have faith and we don't have faith, we do science. No, that is so wrong. Um, if you go to a high-class intellectual history of science conference, the people speaking will say over a meal, for instance, or coffee, yeah, the church was not a perfect patron of science, but we have to admit it was the only patron of science. The only patron of science as we know it. Because in order to do an experiment and expect to get the same result in London as you do in Paris or New York, is an act of faith. And it's only rational for somebody who believes that the God who made the universe is not a God of disorder and he is not arbitrary, he is a God of order. It turned out to be true, but that's a whole long story. So this group uh, became the most interesting 
uh, education I've ever had in my life. It was the best seminar by far. It went on for years, of course, that makes it a good seminar. No paper trail. And we became friends, of course. And then eventually uh, we were bullied into starting the college in uh, 1997. Homeschooling moms and dads and graduate students said, you've got to do something about this. You know what to do and you have the abilities to do it. And we said, well, we, we can't start a course in the university because the first question we will be asked how many women are there in your course? And of course, in the history of science, there aren't very many. There are a few, and most of the feminists don't even know who they are, and I'm not about to tell them. Um, the beginning of uh, coding, for instance, is a good example to go and look at. But, um, so we can't do it. And they said, well, start outside the university. And uh, we did. We said, look, there's got to be no debt associated with this project. Uh, and uh, we can't do any administration, so somebody has to look after the minimal paperwork and administration. And so we started, and we've been going up until COVID. COVID has dealt us some pretty severe blows, and we've got to see what comes of that. We don't know what's going to come of it yet. I'm the only one of the original uh, founders who's still functioning at the college. Uh, they're scattered around the continent or died. Um, or got sick. So it has been an amazing experience. Um, I think I, I sent you a, a, a link uh, last evening from a talk I gave 20 years ago, I think it was, or something of that order, uh, in the University of Wisconsin. And I still get correspondence about it. Now, I don't get correspondence about any lectures I gave in medicine or biochemistry, uh, well that's not quite true, some in medicine, uh, but the comparison is, it's not a comparison at all. And wherever I go around the continent, and at one stage I was giving 400 lectures a year away most weekends, um, people will turn up because of a connection to the college. Uh, all the young people who've taken the course say, I, I, there's never been anything quite like this. And it's not just the intellectual content. Uh, that's why Christian colleges and some other online programs won't achieve the same effect. The most important thing that happens when you have studying going on in a small intimate group is the relationships. And you find you're not alone in your ignorance and you're not alone in your hunger for knowing more. So for instance, there's there's a statistical one in ten probability that you'll find a spouse. You've no idea. You don't find them by looking for them. You, you, you get to love the way they think and what they do. And slowly you realize, hey, we're made for one another. What better way could there be of finding a spouse? And I stay with these people when I travel. Um, it has been really an extraordinary experience. Now, I was the, the least educated member of the group by far. Every, uh, you know, I think every one of the other teachers, at least for a while, spoke at least five languages. I at one time had some capacity in three uh, or four, but I was down to one by the time I'd been in science for a little while. And I knew nothing about the history of science, but we, when we decided to teach a history course, we said, well, there's nobody to do that. They said, you have to do it. I said, I, I know nothing about it. They said, well, at least you know that you know nothing. That's a good starting point. So it was a joint exercise for a long while. Um, but oh, it's been such a blessing to me um, and to other people around the world. Uh, as I began to think through these things over the years, um, the outcome has been incredible. I think the most important three things that happened to me at around the same time that were providential. And they'll form part of another blog if anybody's interested. The first thing was that I never ceased to believe that the Christian story was essentially true. I was a, a funny little kid who read lots of books and played cricket, basically. Um, but I knew that the early church was hounded. I mean, thousands of people were slaughtered for their faith. And I read well, and so when 
Peter writes to people he's never met who've been thrown out of Rome by Nero and company and their families have been slaughtered in the arena. And he writes to them, I know that you have joy beyond words. I mean, what's he talking about? Joy beyond words when you've had that kind of experience? But he knew it was true. It was true. Now, we reduced the gospel over the years. That's a, that's a whole other story. I go south of the equator to see the passion of people who have been released from the control of sin into new ownership. We don't become good when we're converted, but we are under new ownership. We have other means of making progress. And I hadn't thought about that at all, and certainly I didn't practice it for some time. But then Bonhoeffer got to me, um, and I can't track down whether it was a letter somewhere, but he says this, he says, when your Christian faith is in the doldrums, which it will be, um, don't give it up. That's not reason for giving up. It's God saying to you, you think you can do this on your own. You can't. And he said, ask God for a passage of scripture from him to you as a personal gift. Ask him to bring it to life for you. Just add it to your prayers. And what will happen sometime in the next few months is that a passage of scripture will be brought to your attention in a way that you can't deny and you realize you have an inadequate understanding of it. For me, it was the Sermon on the Mount. Now, on my first trip to Africa in 87, that was the year Alan Bloom published The Closing of the American Mind and I hadn't had time to read it and I knew it was causing waves and uh, a lot of anger in the academic world as he said basically we've lost our way way back then and our culture's dying because of it and we'd better fix it and within a year there was a book of responses to Alan Bloom but they didn't they didn't deal with his the questions he'd raised it's always amazing God seems to use unbelieving atheists and uh, people with very unusual views of sexuality to change my mind on lots of things and Alan Bloom was one uh, I realize his his argument in, from my point of view is that if you don't know the Bible, Old and New Testament, you cannot understand your own culture. He said, I don't want to do remedial training, but I need, as an atheist, that people who come to my class will understand biblical metaphors. Now, the modern world doesn't. We're biblically illiterate in, within the church too. Um, one example... The last telegram sent from Dunkirk to London was three words as the British were being pushed into the sea uh, by the Germans. It wasn't coded. It just said, but if not. It was sent to London. The guy who sent it was a Canadian. Um, he was killed. He didn't get home. Uh, but it arrived in the war ministry uh, and was immediately understood. Because when I went to school, uh, well up until roughly the 60s, the Bible was read. A chapter of the Bible was read every day in school. And the British understood this was not for religious reasons. It was for cultural reasons. If you don't know the King James Version of the Bible, not because it's better, but because you can't read Shakespeare unless you know the King James Version. It's laced through. The two interact in an amazing way. And, of course, what doesn't come to the mind of the modern young person that did come to would have come to my mind because I knew the story well it's the story of Shadrach Meshach and Abednego they would not bend the knee to a pagan religion and were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace and they said to Nebuchadnezzar be known unto you O King Nebuchadnezzar that our God is able to save us from the fiery furnace but if not we will not bend the knee and, of course, he did save them from the fiery furnace. But those three words brought into the minds of the people in the ministry of war a whole story and its outcome and the whole big history. That's what the metaphors of a language do. In Black Lives Matter, facing on race and slavery, which is disastrous and awful, and every society in the world has done it. The most slaves in the world currently are in Africa. Far more slaves were taken by Muslims than were ever taken by Christians, none of which expunges any of the guilt of slavery. But 
that isn't the way forward. We were slaves too. Uh, we happen to be slaves in the Roman Empire to a great degree, but you don't have us going after the Italians. It was culture. It's not about race, it's about culture. And you can be trapped in cultures for hundreds of years, thousands of years. We all were. As Chesterton says, paganism was the biggest culture in the world for a long, long time. So the culture changes when fundamental beliefs are adjusted, shall we say. And then your world changes and the world of your children changes and everything else. I mean, the people who got the Industrial Revolution going were educated in the Bible, but little else. So George Stevenson, who made the first commercially viable steam engine, couldn't even read and write when he built his first steam engine. It was intuitive. He'd worked in the mines, in the pits, uh, maintaining the pumps that kept the pits going, and he realized, I could make a version of this on wheels and produce a steam engine, which he did. But he couldn't read or write at the time. So talk about oppression. There's nobody in America who's black, for instance, who hasn't had the opportunity to learn to read and write as well as they want. George Stevenson didn't have that. Neither did most of the people in the early 18th century who made the most important steps forward. They were, they were highly intelligent and they, they put things together. I mean, George Stevenson sent his kid to school and when he came home, he made him go through his whole day's lessons. That's the way he got educated. It didn't take him long because he was extremely smart. Faraday sadly never did enough mathematics um, but that forced him to be a very, well, probably one of the world's best experimental scientists. You see how culture and the story of where we live cannot be understood without considerable depth. And we don't have it anymore. So America is currently losing its way and could lose its way completely if we go on down the line where it we're on at the moment and Canada will certainly follow suit as leading the way in some ways. I mean we've got a sadly a narcissist who knows nothing in charge. Uh, the only thing he ever was was some sort of drama teacher. He's never earned his living properly in his life. Uh, what right has he got to be Prime Minister? Well, we elected him. We liked the way he looked and he said nice things. Happy talk. But happy talk doesn't get us through the present world does it? So all this came out of a serious reading group. Now, those people who are thinking about doing this, you can go to my website, johnpatrick.ca, and find the book list. There's also a metaphor test without the answers so that you can see how biblically literate you are. And I would suggest that you look at, there's a list of half a dozen articles from the magazine called First Things. I chose them because First Things is easily available online. Any one of those talks could fire up a reading group amongst uh, people in church. Men in particular need their own environment to, to be as rough and ready with language as they want to be and they're not allowed to be in public. So I would suggest a male reading group and a female one, uh, but I wouldn't uh, initially anyway. I'd like to see them start as separate sexes because we are different and we function differently. So uh, any of those talks, just look at them. And when you've read one and it's got to take you a little while, about 10 or 11 pages, most of them, and there'll, there'll be a level of reading that's beyond what you do most days. And in fact, it takes you about a year of reading to let them bring you up to speed, but you'll be, very, you'll be grateful to them forever after that. And then you can start sharing them with people who are in the same hungry place that you are. The way that we're consuming trivial entertainment and sport, um, which there's nothing wrong, but it mustn't be as dominant as it is. And the life of the mind has been displaced. Technology and science are not the same thing. Uh, the French still keep the words separate, and the Greeks did too. Techne and science are different. Techne is what working men did. They knew how to do things. Every science has techniques. Building houses, even in the middle of the Africa, there's ways to do it and ways not to do it. And culturally, that is passed on. That's what apprenticeship did. So, so much so that in your family, you learned to do something and you became dye the bread, for instance, in Wales. Or you look at English names, they tell you what the family did in the past. 
And the best pianos in the world were made by Jews in Russia at one stage, but still the best pianos in the world are made by Jews because it, that's technique and it's passed from generation to generation. You learned how to do something and that's what happens. The diamond trade is the same. There are many areas. Uh, we all know that some things are done better in some places than others. Um, nobody would pretend that you want uh, uh, equal outcome in distribution of race in basketball or the National Football League or any of those things. The skills are not evenly distributed. God has distributed them in ways that he thinks best and therefore probably are. So, um, you begin to find things that you never knew about and I got my third career out of this. That uh, Bonhoeffer advice, I came back from the Africa trip and somehow accused the class of being biblically illiterate. Uh, it was the 80s, so you, as professor could say that without there being a riot. But 20 of them or so came afterwards and demanded an, ex an explanation. And I said, look, uh, I won't give you an explanation, let's just test. I think what Bloom ultimately is saying is that without a great book in your life, you cannot have a great culture. The greatest book in the world was the book of nature. That produces a pagan culture, which is fatalistic. Uh, because at first sight, that's the way nature looks. Nature read in tooth and claw, as the poet put it. So uh, our culture has been the Bible for a long while, Old and New Testaments. And without understanding the Bible, you cannot understand yourself. So let's see if you know it. You all think Gandhi was a great man. Always choose somebody from the other side, and then you don't get hammered. Uh, he said that the Sermon on the Mount was the greatest piece of writing that he'd ever come across. So tell me how it starts and what it says. No, even you, uh, Craig, couldn't tell me the opening of the Beatitude, all Beatitudes in sequence. I suspect you might, but I doubt it. Uh, certainly you couldn't do the whole Sermon on the Mount without opening your Bible. Um, but that's where it should, that's the level it should be at. Now, they, they knew nothing. And I said, there you are. Uh, Bloom's right. Your, your total ignoramus is uh, about the fundamental foundations of your society. And they said, well, what are you going to do about it? I said, it's not my problem, it's yours, I'm busy. And they said, but you claim to know things that we ought to know, why don't you teach us? And without thinking about it, it just came straight in my head. I said, well, what you need is an Agnostics Anonymous group because you don't even know the questions, let alone the answers. And they said, yes, that's right, will you teach one? So AA was born on the spot. And uh, it was an extracurricular course and I got 20, 25% of the class. Uh, and the only prerequisite was that you couldn't claim to be a Christian. And the Christians crept in after we started, but they weren't allowed to take part. Uh, it, was, it was very, very important to me. But as I walked away, I realized that I couldn't do what I could do in biochemistry. For undergraduates, medical students, you don't need notes to teach them the biochemistry that might possibly be of some interest to them. They don't practice medicine by referring to biochemistry. That's rubbish. They do it by recipe primarily. And what's passed on from hand to hand, it's an ancient uh, profession. So I couldn't do that with the Sermon on the Mount. So I learned it by heart. And then it, all I can, the only metaphor I can use, it was like rain falling in the desert. Flowers come up overnight. Uh, it started to blossom. If I had my time, it would take me three hours to do the Sermon on the Mount. Now, as I think it might have happened, because we don't have the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible. We have a precy of the Sermon on the Mount given by people who were pre-literate and therefore had very good memories. That's why they could, when they got things sorted out, they could record it properly. They could write it down properly. Um, and it changed the way I think about everything. And our modern world's primary problem is it will not start with the first question, in the beginning, what or who? The Big Bang has sort of made this very clear and they're trying to escape in all sorts of multiverse uh, escape routes, but they don't work. Ultimately, in the beginning, it was someone or something. Which came first, the planner or the product? 
well that's a no-brainer at one level and that's why you see people who are serious thinkers eventually come they talk physicists talk about God easily and you don't get hammered in physics even Hawking talked about God in the last paragraph of his book Probably the, the, the two little books to read are Mary Midgley's uh, Science as Salvation and Evolution as Religion. Uh, she, because she was an atheist, uh, but an honest philosopher, and she writes beautifully, but she lays out the problem for you. I find it much easier to, to think that in the beginning there was a mind, that in the beginning there was a molecule, so to speak. Where did the molecule come from? Uh, or the atom, or the elements? No. Uh, the, this world, this cosmos has a lot of evidence that it's exquisitely designed. I mean, an error of uh, point, what is it, 40 zeros one, and we wouldn't be here. The Planck constant is that precise. And so he goes on, uh, not 40, but Penrose has said that, although he, he was head of the Humanist Society, it looks to me as though the maker's aim was accurate to one part in raised to the power 10, raised to the power 127, if I remember rightly. That's a number you can't even think about. The odds on this being here are negligible. But we're here. That can stop you in your tracks, if you're honest. All that came out of a reading group. Is that enough for <laughs> yes. one day? Um, that was good. Uh, first off, I want to say something. John mentioned his website that you can go to johnpatrick.ca. If you want to learn about Augustine College, you can go to augustinecollege.org. And again, that is up in Canada. Next week, would you want to talk about, say, the Bible and the dinner table and family? Surely. Uh, that's That's been a gift to me. But again, that's going to take a couple of weeks to get through. When, every time I go to Africa, I have to give the Hittites talk at least a dozen times. And I say to the people who are, who are asking me to do it, you've heard me do this. I say, yeah, but we want to bring our friends. And missionaries frequently say, why didn't somebody teach me this at the beginning of my work? Thank you, John. Thank you all for listening today. And next week, we're going to answer the question on Wednesday. And the question is essentially going to be why reading the Bible at the dinner table with your family is such a big, important deal. 